The All-Australian team is a controversial part of any season. While 100% agreement on the best 22 was impossible, much of the criticism levelled at selectors centres around a lack of transparency and consistency in the selection process. In this video, we're letting the stats decide. We started by breaking up the field into subcategories that represent the roles in a modern team. Next, we picked the four stats for each positional category we felt best represented the attributes of that position. For simplicity, these were limited to what was available on the Stats Pro feature on afl.com.au, link in description. Finally, we recorded the player rankings for each category, with their rank representing a points value in a golf like system, where lowest points wins. For example, if a player ranked first in every category, they would receive 4 points. This means the players who ranked the most consistently in the chosen statistics would be selected in the team. It should be noted that this is not our attempt to pick the All-Australian team, but rather should be thought of as an experiment to see what kind of results a purely statistical approach would deliver. And so, after hours of gruelling stat collection, we had our team, and in the theme of keeping things different, we decided to start with the forward line. To begin, we decided to fill five of the spots in the forward line with actual forwards, leaving one spot open for a resting, offensively-minded midfielder, creating a dynamic that reflects how the game is played. The full forward and centre-half forward roles would, of course, be key position players, with two spots then going to small or mid-sized forwards, and a final spot being dedicated to the pressure forward, a role that has become crucial to a side's success. These were perhaps the easiest spots on a team to pick, as the role of key forwards is the most clear cut. You want your tools to be pulling down big grabs inside 50, and if they're not hitting the scoreboard themselves, they're setting up shots for the little guys. The stats chosen to represent this were goals, score involvements, contested marks, and marks inside 50. Unsurprisingly, there were two clear standouts, with Tom Hawkins impressively topping three of the categories to score eight points, and Charlie Dixon not far behind on 11. The much improved Matt Taberner missing out in third. The next category focused on forwards who aren't as damaging in the air, but are still expected to hit the score sheet, gather the dangerous balls that spill loose, and lock the ball in the attacking end. Goals were once again selected, with contested marks replaced by marks inside 50. Tackles inside 50 and forward 50 ground ball gets were also included. Players defined as key forwards were ineligible for these positions. Once again, two clear standouts emerged. An incredibly well-rounded season from Mitch Wallace saw him finish in the top five of each category with a total of 13, and Tom Papley claimed second spot on 19. Finally, we wanted a player who reflects the needs of small forwards to be as damaging with their pressure as they are on the scoreboard. For the statistics of goals, tackles inside 50s, pressure acts, and intercept possessions, Dan Butler was selected with 16 points. Interestingly, young bomber Will Snelling would have been breathing down his neck had goals not been included. With five forward line spots now filled, it was up to the midfield stats to determine the sixth. For the midfield, we wanted to provide balance. Of course, there would be one Ruckman on the field, tapping it down to a centre who was picked as a contested, pressure applying player to complement two more dynamic, attacking midfielders. The two wingers' stats were based on their ability to find the ball in space and dispose of it effectively, and as mentioned, the final half-forward flank was filled by the third-placed midfielder for attacking stats. For rucks, we wanted to capture a balance between dominance in the contest and ability around the ground. We decided to create our own weighted hitouts to advantage stat, which was total hitouts to advantage divided by contests attended. The other three were contested marks, clearances, and one percenters. This meant that Gorn was shifted off the official team's bench on just 11 points ahead of Nick Nadanui. 
To anchor the centre line, we wanted the best contested ball winner in the league. These players win first hands on the football and provide stability for the more dynamic mids alongside them. The statistics that decided this player were effective disposals, contested possessions, total clearances, and pressure acts. These categories were destroyed by Clayton Oliver, who topped three out of four columns on nine points, 18 ahead of second placed Lockie Neal. To find our other two starting mids, we retained effective disposals and contested possessions, but included score involvements and goals to show a more attacking focus. The results justified Brownlow favourite Lockie Neal's selection, who tied with Christian Petraka on 16 points. These two complement each other well. Neal wins plenty of the ball, while Petraka was the league's most damaging midfielder going forward. Third placed was Patrick Dangerfield, whose strong score involvements and goal stats meant he was well suited to fill the final position in the forward line. A lot is made of the winger's selection every year, so we wanted to keep with our theme of choosing a realistically structured side and pick two real wingmen. As a result, we switched to Fox Footy's stats table, which allowed us to search by wingers, the chosen categories being effective kicks, uncontested possessions, inside 50s, and score involvements. Zach Merritt was far and away the clear winner with 11 points, and Jack McRae kept his All-Australian spot in second on 24. The back line proved the hardest area of the field to settle on, with many of the stats available to us feeling inadequate for judging how impactful defenders were. Nonetheless, we pushed ahead, and were greeted with some intriguing results. We decided that the back line would be best suited with three talls. Teams will sometimes play two key forwards alongside a second ruckman, or the concept of the third tall being a player who could provide defensive cover and drop off to intercept is also best reflected by picking three key players. After much debate, the stats selected were lowest defensive contest loss percentage, spoils, intercept marks, and defensive half pressure acts. The clear standout was Carlton's Liam Jones, who topped three of the stats to score just 17 points. Just behind him was Jake Lever, whose range of defensive skills shone through with 21 points, where he was well ahead of third placed Harris Andrews, who claimed a spot in the back pocket. The other back pocket spot would go to a mid-sized defender who was able to balance shutting down an opponent and provide intercepts and rebounds. Across all of lowest defensive loss percentage, intercept possessions, rebound 50s, and defensive half pressure acts. The lowest score was North Melbourne's Luke McDonald. His low one-on-one -on -one numbers were balanced by good performances everywhere else, and helped by the fact that no player scored well in all four categories. Braden Maynard was let down by his pressure acts, but managed to claim second ahead of Adam Saad. Finally, the last two spots on the field were given to halfback flankers who were able to lead the charge out of defence and propel the team forward. To represent success in this area, we chose rebound 50s, metres gained, intercept possessions and effective disposals. Jake Lloyd was the best overall, scoring 12 points. He narrowly defeated Luke Ryan, who won two of the categories. Admittedly, afl.com.au had classified Ryan as a key defender, but at just 186 centimetres, we felt his numbers justify selection as the second halfback flanker. For the bench, we more or less kept the same structure as the official side, selecting a backup ruck, one defender, and two mids, which we dedicated to our wingmen and contested categories. Nick Netanui just claimed the spot, ahead of a peloton filled with Wits, Goldstein, Grundy, and O'Brien scoring 24 points. Braden Maynard was the next best back pocket on 57 points to secure the defence position. Jack Steele was the third best contested player with 29 points, but second placed Neil was already in the side, so the bench spot went to Steele. And Sam Menegola's 32 points to be third on the wing made him the final player selected in the team. To decide who captained the team, we went with the players who were the most outstanding in their positions, 
as captured by the lowest total scores. This saw Tom Hawkins awarded the captaincy and Clayton Oliver chosen as vice captain. We went into this exercise not really knowing how well the stats would perform at picking players, and were committed to sticking to the system regardless what players it turned up. The forward line showed promise, while the midfield showed a couple more surprising results. Travis Boak's highly lauded season was not reflected in the stats, nor was giant defenders Nick Haynes, and Liam Jones was a surprise inclusion, but his numbers are quite remarkable and if our objective was to pick the most statistically dominant players, he has to be included. It's also worth noting that this approach works against teams like Richmond and Collingwood, who implement a highly team-oriented game plan, particularly in defence. As an example, Jones was isolated in the most defensive one-on-one -on -one contests with 88, more than Dylan Grimes and Noah Bolter combined, and equal to Darcy Moore and Roughheads combination. So there are admittedly some key flaws in the way this side was selected, although it's possible these could be overcome with a more nuanced approach and access to more statistical categories. So what do you think? How can we improve for next year? And was this a fair representation of the best players for the 2020 season? Let us know in the comments and subscribe to Footy A to Z for more content. Hey guys, we just wanted to take a quick moment to let you know about our new Patreon page. By becoming a member, you will support us with things like being able to dedicate more time to the channel, buy better equipment, and even continue paying our Adobe subscriptions. To repay the faith, we'll be giving patrons early access on selected videos before they're posted to YouTube, making an exclusive tipping comp next season, and doing some art commissions of your favorite players. If you'd like to sign up, and be sure to follow the link down below. And thank you for your support.